Chapter 6 Threatnagram's a specialty. We'd arrived at the debtor's door. There was no time for hesitation. The potential for naked violence was only a few strides away now. You stay here, lads, and if I'm not out in 15 minutes, come get me. I'd be out in less than that, no doubt. I'd be in no more than a few minutes, I thought. Oh, and if the law turns up, make sure you fuck off sharpish. Drips like these needed that level of guidance. I was doing them both a favour. Wiggly was prone to making mistakes, and Shippy was currently working for slaves' wages at Rawson's Mill, trying to stay on the right side of the law while on licence for an incident involving a black pimp from Leeds and a missold set of golf clubs. I'd have been a bastard of a friend if I'd let him get out. I got out of the car and headed up the narrow path leading to the debtor's door my so-called partners in crime remaining in the car as instructed. No doubt with their fingers and any other feasible limb crossed that the money would be handed over without problem. Maybe even a cup of tea, some bullshit explanation and the whole affair would be over. Life was really that simple, especially in the world of debt collection, where the devil's currency was at stake. I strode rambunctiously through the yard, all down the sides of the garden were high young cedars and elms that acted as a useful cloak to any impending crime that I might or might not commit. I knocked on the door politely first off, trying to catch them off guard. Nothing. I tried the handle, but it was locked, so I gave it a bit of shoulder. It was one of those upmarket made-to-measure 1930s oak slabs, a proper piece of work. I knew I'd be there all day trying to knock it through, so I went round to the side to try and find the nearest decent-sized window. I'd just started to try and force my way through a partially opened window, but again it was proving tricky, when, bang, bang, what the fuck? I had to put my fingers in my ears to drown out the racket. Bang, another. The initial shock had worn off. I felt a real peckerhead. Clearly it was only bangers. I could see the silhouette of some old deer in the living room through the filthy net curtains. It was what I assumed to be the debtor's wife, setting off what were most likely bird scarers in the house and trying to give the impression I was being fired at. It'd take more than that to deter me. I'd heard the silly old cow might interfere, and invariably they always did, but this one had balls the size of dinner plates. I carried on in my vain attempt to force the window, I could see the silhouette of what appeared to be the debtor join the flabby old cow in the front room. Boom! Smash! The silly old bastard had fired a very real shot through the window. It was a mile off the mark, and I'd been a clear shot. Clearly it didn't have the bollocks to see it through. I caught a glimpse of his manic expression, his eyes turning the colour of brake lights. A fat old fella of about fifty, and in need of a shave and a new set of teeth. He had all but his shoes on, and his clothing was positively filthy. I caught sight of the gun in all the commotion. An old antique piece of shit, big enough to bring down an elephant, but not efficient or reliable enough to bring down old Sykesy. The adrenaline was pumping now, and my aggression bubbled. I brushed off the glass shards that had attached themselves to the slazenger training top I was wearing, and made no delay in putting matters right. I ran back round to the front door. My mad was up. My temper came off a hair trigger in these situations. It was right up to eleven now. Without hesitation, I smashed the front door straight off its hinges. First attempt. My shoulder grateful a second one wouldn't be required. I bolted through the door and sidestepped into the room entrance on the right like a seasoned fly half and into the living room where they both stood with faces an inch from the floor. The old man was too frightened now to even hold up the gun, not that it would have deterred me at this point. The old boy had a belly like a landlord's wife. It hung over his shorts like a willow tree. I'd have no trouble with a fat slob like him. I belted him straight in the stomach, even through the protected blamange of his gut, his breath was gone, and at least three of his ribs cracked. Take that, you fat pig, I thought. This guy had got himself stuck in the groove of deceit, and he needed it knocking out of him, and now I'd got his attention. Fair play to him, 
As I stood back to admire my handiwork, he gritted his teeth and came forward throwing punches, though with all the speed, precision and economy of a Sheffield steel lawnmower. I gave him a hard left, knocking him the full length of the room. Not out cold, but such that he didn't have a fucking clue where he was. The left side of his face a crimson mask. He'd play a ball now. I turned around and gave the old deer a nasty backhander. The natural reaction of any sane thinking fella in such a predicament, I thought. With that she burst into a maniacal shriek, a lunatic witch doctor who'd just found the formula. The look on her face told me it wasn't the first time she'd had a slap. She'd probably taken one off the old man at some point. In fact, I'm sure her eyes had lit up momentarily when I laid into him with that left hook. She glared at me for a moment, then yelled, You horrible pig, ugly bastard! That may be the case, but I wasn't the one taking liberties with my friends. Her eyes blazed for an instant. She had the raving needle. Women, in my opinion, were the most devious, treacherous, despicable people on earth, and she was reiterating my point. Women these days had got them far too cocky. They'd been conditioned by birth pills, I thought. Crash! The holdall I'd bought to recover the deck crashed into the wall an inch above her head and frightened her to death for the second time in the last 30 seconds. The old man was still so dazed he didn't quite know what was happening. He grunted from the effort of rising. I took half a step towards him just to let him know he needn't bother. He couldn't leap to his feet quicker than I could hit him anywhere. He was flapping like a fish out of water. The old cow was still on the floor. I gave her a bit more of a slap for good measure and let her know I had no bounds. Any independent observers watching this little drama unfold might have been under the illusion these two were to be pitted. In essence, they'd robbed a good friend of thousands of pounds and in reality, they deserved everything they got. If there was any justice, they'd finish up skint, beaten and terribly disillusioned, lesson enough that they'd never do it again and ready for the next life. I made my way across the room. It was done up like some old granny flat, an oil painting of a spitfire on the back wall and a hideous green sofa that could do with the dust. The kitchen had the remains of yesterday's dinner on the table and the sink was piled high with dirty crockery. She appeared to have been smoking a cigarette before the day's events had unfolded. I casually picked it up from the side and took the last drag, swivelling my head to survey the room and admiring my work. We haven't got any money, the silly old cow pleaded with a newfound despair, and with which I promptly flicked the still burning tab end in her direction. I knew different. She must have thought I'd been born in the nick. All those years in the shovel hadn't been completely wasted. Psychology was one of the subjects that had rubbed off on me like the gold from a snide bracelet. With my formative years spent boxing and in the nick, I'd be a real dummy if I couldn't read people without them even having to open their mouth. I'd been doing it all my life, but anybody could have read the signs these two were giving off. The bile rose in my gorge. She turned my stomach. Not just a figure cause revulsion, but a personal scent. She reminded me of the butchers in Durham Nick. I could see I wasn't going to be able to reason with somebody as determined as her. She had legs like the Michelin X-Man and a double chin like a roll of ham. More violence would most likely be required at some point, and I was an expert at violence. I got hold of the debtor, that's all he was to me, by the throat, and demanded settlement or there'd be murders and merry hell for him and every last one of his relatives, friends and their pets until the debt was cleared. I couldn't afford to take much longer, as one of the neighbours had likely heard the commotion and was now on the blow to the old bill. Though worse than that, these two cretins were starting to grate on me, and that's when I could become dangerous. Listening to their impassioned pleas, anybody would think the death penalty was at stake. He rabbited on about his four kids, and being too proud to sign on the dole, a school at the other side of town, and finished by threatening to let the state raise his children if I took his money. His pleas were fruitless. It was the principle of the thing. The consequences were his problem now, and his excuses made me hate him even more. He was wasting his time. I could smell the wealth in the air. He wasn't traipsing about in filthy clobber because he wasted his cash. I'd heard rumours of other rip-offs he'd carried out, lucrative ones. Eventually, 
staring at me with sorrowful bags under his eyes like car tyres. He reluctantly agreed to pay, but needed a couple of hours to round up the cash. He'd moved it out of the house when the threats had come from up north, probably around the same time I'd been putting petrol in the Volvo. It was strange how the world turned, a path destined to cross. He now knew I was a man of serious intentions, and there was no way they could flee the family home forever. He clearly hadn't been given it by the council like Shippy, and his life, just like his mortgage, was simply borrowed time. I was just about to leave when a sharp reflection caught the corner of my eye. The rings, I said, staring at the old bag's hands. They were heavily bejeweled and reeked of value. I'll take them as a deposit. You can have them back when I collect the debt. Obviously, that was bollocks. With that, I ragged them from the old fishwife's hands and put them in my jacket pocket. I faced the epitome of abject misery. I agreed I'd be back to see him later that day at an alternative property nearby. That suited me as there was less chance of the police turning up in the meantime, given all the commotion. He had my word that I'd burn the place to the floor with every man, woman and child still inside if the debt wasn't cleared that day, and I was in no doubt that I would. It was obvious to me that his problems were all self-induced, those car tyres under his eyes a symbol of a life of deceit. Yes, I was a crook, but my eyes weren't burdened with tyres like his. I'd always slept well. I'd never taken a liberty in my life, and in every case I was in the right. The old deer turned and left the room, with her shoulders slumped and her chin down. This was the final straw for her. When the debt was paid, she'd be taking no more shit. The kids would be long left home, and she had no reason to hang around. Oh, well, that's what I told myself. I left the living room and strode calmly towards the front door. There were three ducks flying up the stairs and brass ornaments all over the house. It was musty too. The old fella obviously wouldn't let her open the windows or even the curtains in case a passing burglar or bailiff happened to look through the window. Without an intake of natural light, their eye muscles would surely atrophy. They'd be blind before the year was out, I reckoned. I headed back to the car. Confident that later that afternoon we'd be heading home with the haul worthy of the trip. Sorted lads, we're picking up the money in an hour or so, I stated calmly, and sat back in the driver's seat of the Volvo.